So this is Failure Detectors at Papers We Love New York. I, this, I'm Kieran Bataram, and I've worked at a company called Stripe for a little over three and a half years now. I love hearing about the history of technology, so let me know if you have any good stories after this. Um, also, I speak quickly, so flail if I get unintelligible. <laughs> so why Failure Detectors? They're pervasive in the design, analysis, and implementation of a lot of fault-tolerant distributed algorithms. So when I first started working on this talk, I'd heard about SWIM and read about a few failure detectors, but hadn't realized exactly how incredibly rich this vein of research was. From the original impossibility result that spawned the failure detector abstraction, to the sheer amount of ink spilled over consensus protocols, failure detectors have inspired a flurry of research. So the aim of this talk is to introduce sort of a, um, an introductory survey to the concept. I'll be concentrating on a fairly narrow slice of the field, pulling a few illustrative examples from the history of failure detectors from each section. So, uh, timeline. We'll talk about the background and the FLP impossibility result that kicked off this whole branch of research, and the system result on, sorry, the system models under which these results hold true. Then we'll get to the meat of the paper, what the proposal and the abstraction is, how it solves the consensus problems that FLP proposes. Then dip into a few other distributed systems algorithms that failure detectors enable. I'll just be name checking here, so if there, um, there's a bibliography at the end if you want to read more about those. Then we'll discuss one or two examples of failure detectors that I've seen in production. A disclaimer that this is not an exhaustive list by any means. These are a few that I've run into or read about. I'd love to hear about your favorite one after this. Um, and here are all the animations I forgot to click through. <laughs> so the background. Um, we'll talk about the failure space, sorry, the problem space and background briefly. The system models, what consensus is, and the impossibility result that inspired this paper. Some of this should be familiar, but I'm just going to lay down the ground rules so we're all on the same page here. Um, so first, the system models are the set of assumptions about the system that um, we'll be operating in. So how long do operations take? How reliable is message delivery? What kind of crashes happen? The first simplest system model we'll talk about today is the synchronous model. There's an upper bound on both message delivery time and processing time. Totally realistic. Um, it has reliable delivery, which every system I work on does, and processes fail by crashing and never come back up again. It's great. <laughs> Asynchronous systems, in contrast, have no upper bounds on time. These are systems in which it's unclear if processing will ever stop. Finishing a calculation can take arbitrary amounts of time. Similarly, message delivery delay has no upper bound. You can receive a packet minutes, months, or years after it's delivered. That said, it's still reliable um, delivery, and processes still crash by failing, sorry, by stopping. So the assumptions these make are slightly more realistic and closer to what we work with. So these have an imp important practical aspect. Algorithms developed for them are fairly general because they work irrespective of whether the system is fast or slow. In contrast, when you're working with synchronous systems, you're explicitly relying on particular timing assumptions. So you're encoding timeouts and things like that directly into your system. So it's hard to decide what assumptions you're going to be making because the timing behavior of real systems vary wildly in practice. So the problems we'll be talking about today. Consensus is getting several distributed nodes to agree on a value for something at its heart. It's one of the building blocks for distributed systems. It appears as a base for many algorithms, from synchronizing replicated state machines for databases, electing a leader, or managing group membership for service discovery. Um, more specifically, consensus requires three properties to be true. Termination, which is the processing will eventually conclude. Agreement, that all of the nodes agree on the same value. And validity, that some node will have proposed the agreed upon value. You can't just reach consensus by everyone saying, I, there is no value, I don't believe in consensus. Um, so consensus is known to be solvable in synchronous systems, even in the presence of faults. Jumping ahead a little, this is kind of because you can use the timeouts to determine whether a process has crashed. As long as you wait out both the processing time upper bound and the message delivery upper bound, you can assume the process has failed. In a sense, this is sort of a perfect failure detector. Um, now, consensus in asynchronous systems um, the FLP result resolved an argument that had been going on for the previous five to 10 years. 
There was actually a San Francisco Papers We Love talk about this like three years ago. Um, this is a whirlwind introduction. If you want more, Henry Robinson wrote up his Papers We Love talk on his blog. Um, so consensus is impossible in asynchronous systems because accurate failure detection is impossible. It's, um, you can't tell a very, a very, very slow process apart from a crash process, so you don't know how long you're waiting. This is similar to why consensus is difficult in system models without reliable links. Even in synchronous systems with lossy links, consensus approach is impossible. Um, what? But, but Paxos. <laughs> so a large asterisk on the FLP result, it proves that any fault-tolerant alg uh, algorithm solving consensus has runs that never terminate. But these runs can be extremely unlikely. Um, one paper um, published after FLP by someone called Ben Orr showed that given a little bit of randomness injected into the system, the system achieves consensus with probability approaching one. This still weakens the termination result because there is a very, very small non-zero probability that you will end up in an indeterminate um, state, but probability one is good enough for most cases. Um, but the interesting thing that the FLP result does show is that in one very particular asynchronous system model with no upper bound on time, there exists one configuration in which it's possible that consensus will never terminate. So consensus is impossible means consensus is not always possible. Um, though these runs are unlikely, they imply that we cannot find a totally correct solution. It's enough to show that there is one initial configuration in which a given protocol will not work because that configuration can never be entirely ruled out. Um, it gives us sort of a bound in what is possible in the perfectly asynchronous model. So what now? We haven't really lost all of our hope. Um, once the FLP result was published, there was a flurry of research in the distributed systems community. People started writing papers about what minimal augments you had to make to the asynchronous system model to make consensus possible again. It's really, really sensitive to the initial um, asynchronous model that you're talking about. And the follow-ups proposed a plethora of slightly augmented models. Um, one paper defined 32 different branches of partial synchrony at which, and described exactly what algorithms you can solve in each of those 32 cases, which is a lot of overhead. Um, this is where failure detectors come in as an abstraction. So this paper, Unreliable Failure Detectors for Reliable Distributed Systems, introduced the abstraction of failure detectors as augments to the asynchronous system model. So we're still operating in an async model mostly, but there's like a little tack on you have that encapsulate a lot of, uh, encapsulates a lot of the complexity. Um, since its publication, failure detectors have become a core abstraction in a number of different algorithms. This paper won the Dijkstra Award in 2010, which is an award given to papers in computer science that have had at least a decade of impact after their publication. Um, we'll dip into some of the impact later, but let's get into the meat of the paper. So failure detectors attempt to answer, oh, I forgot to mention, there are little markers for what part of the talk we're in at the bottom right corner, so we're now in the paper section. Um, they attempt to answer, when do you stop waiting on a process to get back to you? So they provide some hints about whether the process has failed or if it's merely slow. Um, so they attempt to make guesses at what processes are still alive. Like the Oracle of Delphi, the failure of detectors can err in several ways. They can be vague, misleading, and very occasionally they can actually be correct. Um, so yeah, they, they can incorrectly suspect a process. They, have, they can have different lists and vary entirely. They might suspect a process initially and then change their mind later. They can be as floppy as you want them to be. Um, so there are several classes of failure detectors, and this paper talks about how to classify and separate each section so we can talk about them. So the two major axes the paper proposes are completeness and accuracy. I kind of think about them as having no false negatives and no false positives. Um, so the notation I'll be using is that here nodes A, B, C, and D exist. A and D have crashed, B and C are still alive. You'll be seeing this throughout the next few slides. Um, so putting these two characters together, we end up with eight kinds of failure detectors. Um, though there technically are only four, we, we will talk about transforming one to another. So we'll start by talking about completeness. There is strong and weak completeness. Um, weak completeness is where every node that has crashed is permanently suspected by at least one alive node. So here, B knows that D has crashed, and C knows that A has crashed. The counterpoint to this is strong completeness, which states that 
eventually every process that has crashed is permanently suspected, suspected by every correct process. So eventually, A and D know that, um, sorry, B knows that A and D has crashed, and C knows that A and D has crashed. This paper shows that weak and strong completeness are equivalent. You can transform any failure detector with weak completeness into a strong one by B and C broadcasting their list of sus currently suspected nodes. Eventually, they will all know about who has failed. Um, so completeness on its own isn't a sufficient metric. You can achieve perfect completeness by just suspecting the entire world forever and never talking to anyone. If you run distributed systems, I recommend this. Um, so this is what our grid of classification looks like now. We have strong completeness and four flavors of accuracy. So focusing on the first two pillars of accuracy, we said this focused on minimizing false positives. So per in perfect accuracy, no node is suspected of dying, sorry, no node is suspected before it crashes. So here, B, everyone is alive, C crashes, and B hears about it. Perfect accuracy. Weak accuracy states that at least one correct process is never suspected. Um, B, C, and D are paranoid about each other, but no one suspects A, so you have one process that everyone trusts. Um, even weak accuracy is difficult to achieve. It basically means that you've made no mistakes ever about who, you're, um, about who you suspect. So these second two pillars are kind of helpful. They're eventually strong and eventually weak. These are similar to strong and weak, but they are allowed to err initially. They may have false positives, but there's a time after which they settle and never suspect a process that is still alive. So eventually strong accuracy states that there is a time after which no correct process is suspected by any other correct process. Um, these failure detectors properties don't have to hold forever. It's enough that they hold for sufficiently long enough that you've run through your phase of your algorithm. So here eventually C suspects, um, sorry, B suspects C. D thinks that B is also dead, but that's fine because no one's, um, it eventually transitions to knowing that B is still alive, everything is fine. And eventually weak is the counterpoint here where everyone suspects everyone else, but eventually they settle on not suspecting A. Um, great, still with me? <laughs> so the corollary is that accuracy isn't a sufficient metric either. You can achieve perfect accuracy by never suspecting a process. So, Putting these two characters together, we end up with these four kinds of failure detectors. Um, great. So the paper then goes on to show that you only really need eventually strong to solve consensus. Um, when I was writing this talk, I have a note in my speaker's notes about having no idea how to pronounce diamond S out loud. Lots of frantic Googling. Um, so this is what the um, algorithm they propose for consensus looks like. There's a request, you say hello, you generate a random number, you maybe do stuff you def I'm, I'm kidding. This is from a James Mickens paper that I highly recommend. It's two pages long, makes fun of Byzantine consensus. Um, so the algorithm they propose. In the first phase, every process sends its current estimate of a value timestamped with the round number, and you choose a... Um, current round leader by just modding the round number with the number of nodes that you, um, that you know are alive. So once the coordinator has received a vote from the majority of nodes, it picks the value with the highest round number. Let's say C has died in the process. Um, you move on once, B, once the coordinator has received a majority of proposals from the nodes. In phase two, once it's received a majority of proposals, it sends all of the existing nodes its current proposal. There's no waiting here, so that's fine. Um, in phase three, each process either responds with an ACK for that proposal, or it knacks it because it thinks the coordinator may have died and they should restart the round. If the majority of the votes are, I have some of those arrows backwards. If the majority of the votes are ACKs, it can proceed. Um, the failure detector that D is um, consulting satisfies strong completeness, which means that if B has gone down, eventually all of the other live nodes will realize this and then switch the next round. Because um, strong completeness means that eventually you will realize that um, you will have knowledge of all of the nodes that have gone down. On the flip side, 
With this class of failure detectors, all processes may be erroneously added to the list of suspects at some point in time or another. Everyone may suspect B at some point. But there is a correct process and a time after which that process is not suspected to have crashed. So at some point in time, one of those nodes will be the little like wings and halo that we saw earlier. So there will be a node that everyone trusts, and then consensus can proceed from there. Um, it might take a few rounds, but you will find a coordinator that works. Yeah, so you move on when either the majority has voted, either AX or NAX, or you cancel if eventually all nodes realize B has gone down and they move on to the next round. So there's no waiting here either. Um, so in phase four, once it's received a majority of votes, if they were AX, it knows that a majority of processes have decided and committed a value. So there are two places where this algorithm might block, and the failure detector helps elude both of them. First, when the coordinator is waiting on the majority of nodes to propose a value, and second, when um, the coordinator, sorry, when the nodes are voting back to them. So in both of those cases, having a, um, having a failure detector that satisfies strong completeness helps you avoid the waiting forever that we saw with asynchronous models. Um, so the paper then goes on to explain a very simple example of a failure detector that would satisfy this, where every node sends a heartbeat to every other node. So let's say the communication to B was slow. If node B hasn't heard from A in a while, it marks it as suspected. If it later hears from A, it marks it as unsuspected and increases the length of its timeout. So strong completeness works out. Okay, so that was the paper. After its publication, researchers started applying the failure detector to a variety of problems, like reliable delivery. So um, after the publication of this paper, the problems and models that failure detectors were adapted for were fairly minimal. Um, we're talking about asynchronous systems with fail-stop processes, where the processes never recover once they crash. You have no message losses. And the problems that this applied to were specifically consensus and atomic broadcast. Um, after the publication of the paper, people proposed a billion different kinds of failure detectors from, these are some names, um, and a few more, um, and, a, and a few more problems. So they, a survey paper that's a follow-up to this that I recommend talks about how you would implement non-blocking atomic commit um, where a set of processes agree on whether to commit a change or abort it. You'll see this in database transactions. This requires a class called anonymously perfect failure detectors. If a crash happens, you want to know about it. You don't need to know who crashed as long as you know that a crash happened. Um, another follow-up was for quiescent communication in lossy networks. You want to make sure that a message has been delivered and keep re-delivering it until someone acts, but you don't want to re-deliver the message for all of eternity. You want there to be a stop, so the communication is quiescent. Um, you can solve this with something called a heartbeat failure detector, but you can't, um, sorry, you can also solve this with, with eventually perfect failure detectors, but those are difficult to build on a lossy network. So the paper proposed something called heartbeats, which implement non-quiescent communications. You keep sending a heartbeat, um, so the failure detectors never quiesce. And there were more after this, different kinds of crashes and link failures, failure detectors for detecting partitioning, for crash recovery models, and a billion other problems. So one of the things that I found interesting reading some of these papers is that a lot of these um, use failure detectors to encapsulate the hairy bits or the frustrations of other system models. So when we were talking about um, eventually weak or eventually strong systems, they use timeouts, so they do rely upon some guarantees of the synchronous system model, but they expose it to a consensus algorithm that can operate entirely asynchronously. So they kind of wrap up all the synchronous bits. Similar to when we were talking about the quiescent communication problem, it's implemented on top of a non-quiescent failure detector. But again, it's like wrapping that up. So you can, produce, you can put an abstraction on the frustrating parts of systems you can deal with. So you can operate with fairly asynchronous, fairly simple algorithms. Um, so in a sense, there's sort of a neat abstraction of a bunch of really frustrating um, assumptions you might make about a model. Cool. Um, 
everything good? Still makes sense? Great. So, so far we've been talking mostly about failure detectors in the abstract, what their properties are, how they enable consensus, and how we'd categorize them. So this is a good point to talk about some that have been implemented in practice and what properties you want from something you run on actual computers in an actual rack, and a few examples of those, or on AWS, where you don't have to think about computers. <laughs> and they're all Turing machines and space is infinite. And, um. <laughs> so in production, completeness and accuracy are great, but you also want to think about network efficiency and message load. You don't want your... Um, your membership algorithm to completely swamp out any actual talking you're having. You don't want to overwhelm your NICs with just, hi, I'm here, hi, I'm here, hi. I'm, um. You want to optimize for speed of first detection. If a node has crashed, it's useful to not keep sending it jobs or traffic. You want to optimize your speed of knowledge propagation, um, the strong completeness bits. You want to optimize how quickly every other node knows about a failed node and minimize floppy alerts because rebalances can be expensive depending on what you're doing with your failure detector. Um, so one of the ones that actually spurred this talk was one called SWIM, which is sort of an acronym for Scalable Weekly Consistent Infection Style Process Group Membership Protocol. <laughs> um, we know, we've actually heard some of these words before. We now know what weak consistency is and what gossip and infection is and what process membership might be. Um, so it adds a couple of features on top of the basic failure detector we saw earlier from the paper. Um, it main so it minimizes network bandwidth by maintaining a constant message load for every group member, and it propagates membership updates with gossip. Um, it's time to detection. It, they prove that they have a de deterministic bound on how long it takes to detect a node, and they prevent flappy or they decrease flappy alerts by suspecting nodes before declaring them dead. So it, the way it works is that instead of pinging its instead of pinging every node forever, which would be quadratic, it chooses a few nodes at random, and once these nodes are chosen, they shuffle every time, so you get to every single node within linear time, because it's possible to end up in a pathological state where you keep choosing the same k random nodes over and over and over again. Um, so it pings these k random nodes. And if the direct ping fails, it selects another random node to ping the failed node with an indirect ping. So um, this way you maintain some amount of constant, you, for every additional node added, you know that you're only adding k extra messages to the network. Um, it also piggybacks membership updates onto the ping requests. So instead of doing a multicast for, um, for its updates about, about membership, it just adds that to the ping message. So if reaching out to this node fails, it'll ping B later. That also fails. And then it'll tell, um, when it does its next ping for its next random nodes, it'll tell everyone else that it suspects that B is dead. So it kind of co-ops the ping networks to gossip information about the rest of the network. Um, there are a few other changes to the classic protocol that make it nifty, but I'll direct you to the paper for that because we're coming on time-ish. Um, Boilerplate. <laughs> so the FIA cruel failure detector. Um, oh, I forgot to mention that SWIM was um, SWIM's used in console and raft, which are pr things I've used in production for service discovery. Um, so the FIA cruel failure detectors maintain a continuous suspicion threshold instead of setting something as being just live or dead. So it maintains a um, so instead of just having a binary decision, it has a series of things. Um, it's used in Cassandra and Akka clusters, which I've heard some of you use. Um, so the failure detector keeps notes about the arrival time between heartbeats to form a hypothesis of, of how suspicious a particular node looks. So it's received ping heartbeats from a bunch of nodes, sees kind of ghosting, so it looks fairly suspicious. Um, it decouples monitoring and interpretation, which makes them applicable to a fairly wide um, set of scenarios. See, I, by keeping a history of failure statistics calculated from heartbeats, um, instead of just return, answering yes or no to the question, is this node down, it returns a phi value representing the likelihood that the node is down. So this is handy for a couple of different things. Let's imagine a job scheduler. 
So if you suspect that the, if you have like a 25% suspicion that the node is down, you can just stop sending it new jobs. So you're like cutting off damage there. If it comes back up, everything is great. You can keep sending it new jobs. No rebalancing done, no repeated work. If you're 50% sure it's dead, you can stop sending it, you, um, sorry, you can reschedule the jobs that are currently running on the node to another node and wait for it to recover. At a 75% chance of failure, it's probably down. It really hasn't responded to a heartbeat. Even if it isn't down, it's probably super slow. So you want to remove it from the list of healthy nodes and free all of its resources. Um. So a quick bibliography. Um, we, talk, we started by talking about the FLP result and the Chandra 2 egg paper, which was the unreliable failure detectors for reliable distributed systems. Um, some of the things I referenced in the non-blocking atomic commit and quiescent communication come from both the Rayal survey, Raynal survey and the Garawi. And we also talked about the swim and fire cruel failure detectors. So we talked about the FLP result the background, its history, its system models, what consensus is and what the impossibility result is. Um, had a brief discussion about the paper, what failure detectors were, how you'd classify them, and how they help solve consensus in asynchronous systems. Um, the expanding scope that happened after the paper's publication, what the new models were, what new problems were, and dipped into a couple of examples of what productionization of these might look like, and talked about swim and fry accrual. Cool. Um, thanks. I'm Karen. Hi. A couple of slides back, you had um, a few thresholds listed 25%, 50 75%. Um, are those like opt optimally derived? Those were pulled they from just the paper. To work? They were an example of what they had used. Did you have a question? Yeah, would you be able to uh, compare SWIM and Acryl and um, just, I guess, note uh, where you want to use either one? Um, accrual is handy if you have a lot of information about the business logic that you're operating it on. Um, SWIM's handy for membership protocols, like um, which of these nodes do I want to send traffic to, and similar use cases. So it's, it's handy if you don't have any information about exactly what traffic you're sending it, and you just want a is alive, is dead. Phi accrual gives you a lot more nuance about it, but also comes with a lot more complexity. And there are many other failure detectors out there. These are two that are fun to implement. Maybe I'll be done before pizza. <laughs> yeah. I sort of have an offbeat question. Oh. I sort of have an offbeat question uh, in the context of consensus. Mm -hmm. Ever played around with the notion of something being dishonest? Byzantine failures? That's actually what this is going to take a minute ah what this is alluding to right um yeah there are failure detector models that were developed f um, for system models in which there is byzantine failures so literature is out there yeah okay so in the context for example of a system that's being hacked where you, something's trying to be brought down because something externally is being injected mm -hmm. so yeah. Any, any ways of being able to optimize detection of that process itself and being able to then use that to know whether the process is honest in reporting reliably that it's actually yeah. alive yeah. or dead. Byzantine failures are totally a thing. Um, like the cheapest thing you might do there is something that a couple of old spacecraft used where you run five processors, you have all of them compute a result, then you yeah. take the majority value and the one that like was hit by radiation and bit flipped is incorrect. But cool. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Byzantine failures is what you want to look for. Uh, going back to uh, your um, atomic commit in diamond, mm -hmm. the rabbit diamond, I was wondering if you have strong uh, metrics from a node and uh, seems like uh, B 
is value and A is growth. I don't, I don't know, when, when does it end? When do you uh, throw in the towel on B? Um, about consensus? Yeah, essentially. I see. Um, so you have eventually, sorry, you have strongly complete failure detectors. So at some point in time, everyone agrees that B is dead and they all knack it. And at that point, you move on. So you're still waiting out timeouts in a sense, but your timeouts are encapsulated in your failure detector. Um, do you know of some, what would be some modern uh, open problems that are in, related to this, um, that are low-hanging fruit in the sense of important and relevant but not completely intractable? Um, I would have a grad school thesis if I had a good sense for that. Good answer. Um, specifically about the low-hanging fruit bits. Um, so along the lines of the uh, Byzantine failures, um, do you have an idea um, or, or like any notion of like whether or not uh, either swim versus, what was the other one? Um, FICRL. FICRL. Um, uh, if one of these things are, is easier to implement um, or like more, you know, like, uh, uh, like less prone to, uh, to coding in bugs. Um. I don't believe that either of them accounts for Byzantine failures. For coding in bugs, I would say that SWIM is slightly easier to implement, given that you're not also writing extra logic around exactly what you do about the value of phi. I am a strong believer in that the less code you have, the better you're doing. Speaking about the phi accrual, is it that each of the processes has a different view of the world and they all have different five values. Yep. So at some point, somebody's gonna decide that C is sketchy and C isn't uh, uh, performing and they'll all agree on that, right? Mm -hmm. So I guess it's just sort of like someone will have, five will be 25 and some will have five is 50, but eventually they'll all get to the same agreement. Yeah. Okay. About, yeah. Um, assuming fail stop, it'll never come back up again. So you'll keep, heart, you, you'll keep not receiving heartbeats from it and you'll approach it being completely down. What happens if you don't have fail stop? You have different failure detectors for that. Um, there is, yeah, that you could have crash recovery as one of your big failure models. Um, do you have thoughts about how this might be relevant in, as a application developer practitioner in, in the sense where, like five years ago when I was studying some of this stuff, Amazon could just shut down your EC2 instance for no reason. Yep. And that was a perfect example of why you would need all this stuff, right? Yep. And nowadays you set up an EC2 instance, it could run for years with no problems, right? Um, Until you get the, we have to change out that rack and update the kernel because there was a bug. Right, out. right. So there's this, but but the but the, the the types of failures become very different in the sense of like they're less common. Mm -hmm. um, you Sometimes know, you sort of you get notified notice, by email. Yeah. Um, but like, but then there are other failures, right? Like S3 goes down or something mm -hmm. like that, right? Um, and so I don't know. I, I guess I, I'm interested in sort of thinking about ways to develop software that you know kind of is resilient in this sense. Don't talk to anyone. Um, Coordination-free um, algorithms are a set of research that people are working on, so there is some of that. Um, I think it's also handy, even if you have foreknowledge, to not have to update all of your um, service discovery systems that you are about to take a node down. Being able to reboot with no overhead is really handy. Reboot or redeploy or kill a node yeah. Even if you do have notice, it's nice to just have systems that can go down without affecting anything. Great. I'll be around.